Have you ever felt the sadness of finishing a game that you did not want to end? Knowing that there's nothing left that's ever going to come of it? Well, I felt that way with The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine, an expansion pack to a game that I felt to be heartwarming, generous, ambitious, fun, and all around one of the best experiences in video game history, carrying only the most minor flaws. When I finally finished it, I felt a bittersweet melancholy. I was happy to see the ending, but I was sad that it was over and quite possibly the end of the road for Geralt's original story. But unlike many other titles, I continued to go back to Blood and Wine over the years, completing it on various playthroughs to see what I had missed. I've clocked over 90 hours in the expansion pack alone, and the truth is I haven't even fully explored the map yet, haven't upgraded all my potions, haven't completed all the Witcher gear hunts, and I haven't completed every side quest either. I often just wander off into the middle of nowhere in this game just to see what I can find chasing orange fading sunsets on horseback for really no reason, not caring where I end up. It's just so goddamn beautiful, and the bonus is I seem to stumble upon interesting things every time I do so. Some secret new quest to complete the five virtues for Arendite, a monster to kill underneath a wine cellar, or someone new to talk to such as Count Belladal in his quest Big Game Hunter. And every time I meet someone, I find that they're not just an NPC. It's a mini story to help a lowly knight swoon his beloved, a hermit that I could help rid a phantom of, a chance to learn something about the Witcher mutation backstory, the choice to kill or save the last dying breed of Basilisk, or a moment that broke the fourth wall, often tying back to a past game or some character I had met 30 hours ago on the side of a dirty road. These ancillary moments, typically afterthoughts in many other games, breathe a tremendous life into the Blood and Wine expansion by pushing out the Witcher's gameplay beyond the central story, which frankly is also fucking fantastic. For me, the Wild Hunts takes the cake for having the most interesting main adventure, however Blood and Wine should be praised for presenting one that's almost as absorbing but also in a far more coherent fashion and in a more tightly woven package. While The Wild Hunts was large, expansive, and narratively obtuse, Blood and Wine is focused and dense. The story is very straightforward. Geralt shows up in Toussaint to investigate the murder of a number of royal knights. Geralt tracks down the vampire Detlef, and Regis intervenes the fight and convinces them not to kill each other. Geralt finds out that Detlef has been blackmailed, and the Duchess reveals that it's her sister Sienna behind it. So Geralt runs off to find why her sister did it and helps resolve the conflict. And that's pretty much it. The compression of the story, as well as what you do on the side, is one of Blood and Wine's biggest strengths, replacing the vastness of The Witcher 3 with bite-sized story arcs that connect perfectly. The beauty is that each one of these mini-stories has a very natural arc, whisking you off to the next one with the satisfaction that things are moving along briskly. When one passage of Blood and Wine ends, whether it's with the investigation or with the forewarning family troubles, it seems like the game is ready to present the next one on the back of the momentum it had built, turning Blood and Wine into one of the most well-paced games that wears the badge of open world. And given the smaller map size of Toussaint, travel times are lower, making activities less of a hassle to jump in and out of, which encourages more natural exploration as things move along. I guess what I'm trying to explain, rather crudely, is that Blood and Wine is the perfect miniature-sized Witcher game that feels almost as grand as The Witcher 3, but more immediately cohesive and easy to play and finish, not to mention more untwisted. Thankfully, everything's pretty easy to understand as well because the characters that present the information are, are very strong and very clear. Regis as Geralt's sidekick does a great job explaining the various motivations of Detlaf and the history of the vampires, and he himself is one of the most, again, clearly written characters of all of the Witcher games. Between his friendship for Geralt and his loyalty to a vampire that's basically killing everything in sight and creating all this ruckus, he walks a very thin line in this story of being both a close friend and someone you gotta keep your eye on because he's struggling to hold on to a debt that maybe, perhaps he shouldn't. As the narrative vehicle occupying the dusty catacombs below the graveyard and many of your adventures as well, Regis gets a big thumbs up from me. Anna Henrietta, on the other hand, takes care of the other part of the story, aka Sienna and the Curse of the Black Sun. When it's discovered that Sienna is responsible for the killing spree in Buclair, an entirely new sub-story is revealed recounting her tragic exile, wherein she was stripped of her birthright and banished from the kingdom for doing something stupid as a kid, one in which Anna kept silent, bestowing all the punishment on her fair sister. So fast forward, Sienna sets up a ploy where she tricks Detlef into believing she's been kidnapped, only to be released should he agree to kill those who wronged her in her past life, her sweet plot for revenge. This two-way plot works incredibly well for the Blood and Wine expansion, both direct and interesting, albeit kind of easy to see coming, yet it's still carried very well by a brand new set of faces. 
It's rare for an expansion pack to ditch every single pre-established character of its respective franchise, as it's easier and less work to simply carry those things over. Hearts of Stone took some liberty here with Gunther Odem, the master of mirrors, making him the staple and frankly fantastic villain. If you remember, he was a traveling merchant who helped Geralt find Yennefer at the beginning of The Witcher 3. HOS also brought back Shawnee from The Witcher 1 as Geralt's potential love interest slash sidekick slash hot babe medic, and obviously the entire game took place in Northern Temeria, which again is where the base game resides. Blood and Wine, however, brings absolute Absolutely nothing over from prior games, and for that, it had to work extra hard to introduce, build, and connect everything to the player from the onset. Not to mention completely renovate the game's art assets to create the very enchanting terrain of Toussaint. And after stepping one foot into this colorful new land, there's no mistaking that it managed to do that very easily. From the bright rolling hills to the vibrant greens and yellows to the ocean blue skyboxes, purple vineyards and huge fantasy castles, lakes and a frosty mountain looming in the distance, Toussaint is pretty much the opposite of Valen's dark veneer, Novigrad's soiled city streets and Skellige's frosty features. And for those that stumble into the land of a thousand fables, which you can miss, you'll be treated to even more color and dazzle. I'd imagine many players who love the grim, dirty, dark, and wetness of Velen and its surrounding areas didn't enjoy the brightness of Toussaint, but that's actually why I love it. For my money, this fairy tale land is one of the most pleasing environments I've ever seen in a game. A fictional wonderland of giant mushrooms, huge rainbows, the yellow brick road, and Longlox's tower nestled upon central rock. And as per the norm with The Witcher, this isn't just a pretty picture. The land of a thousand fables has you running around nostalgic bedtime stories of your childhood, and every one of them is simply a joy to experience. The big bad wolf. The Three Little Pigs, Snow White, Jack and the Beanstalk, ah, very lovely stuff. Not to mention, you have the option to shag Sienna if you feel so inclined on the side. It wouldn't be a Witcher game without some sexual now, would it? Seriously though, on that note, they have sex in the clouds. I mean, talk about doing the unnecessary. They could have just banged on the grass and everyone would have been happy. But nope, CDPR going the extra mile again. Their presentations for just about every piece of content is basically on another planet. Can you believe Blood and Wine lets you miss this magical area? Frankly, that's a good description of what it means to be a Witcher game. There's so much to see, and there's so much that can change based off how you interact with it. Depending on your dialogue choices, completely new things can be found. Additional conversations, different character reactions which lead to relationship divergence, new subquests, and even new areas of the game. So if you want to see everything, you'll have to replay the game to see where the other road goes. Of all the games on the market, I truly feel like The Witcher 3 and its DLC do this better than any other game. This is a game that enchants, delights, surprises, and resides within a very small pantheon of gaming's greatest stories ever created. The truth is, it took me a long time to warm up to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I guess I was kind of burnt out on the open world at the time and everything that went along with it. But when I did open up to it, I found a game that I'd never forget. And of all the great content in the Witcher universe, I feel like Blood and Wine has stayed longest in my heart. It certainly doesn't have the best story of the franchise, I'd have to give that to Hearts of Stone. And it certainly doesn't have the range of Wild Hunts. Such a massive network of content can never be rivaled in a piece of DLC. But it certainly is the most well-rounded, fun, and beautiful of them all. The cities are bustling, the air is crisp, and the monsters are ripe for the killing. This is Blood and Wine, the best expansion to an RPG that's ever been made. Hey guys, thanks for watching my discussion on Blood and Wine, or I guess my gushing of my favorite expansion pack of all time. Listen, it's not it's not the perfect expansion pack. It just so happens to be my favorite, and uh, I think the most satisfying piece of content you can buy f uh, post-release for a video game. Um, there's been some other ones in the past, including The Old Hunters and Diablo II Lords of Destruction, which were phenomenal, among many, many others. But for me, Blood and Wine is... It definitely takes the cake. However, it's it's not perfect or without flaws. Um, namely, chiefly, the mutation system placed within the Blood and Wine expansion. It's not balanced. <laughs> the quest to get the mutations are, is pretty cool in the backstory that goes along with it. But the skills themselves are not balanced whatsoever. There's two skills in particular that above and beyond are way better than anything else uh, you can choose. Euphoria for uh, sword based builds and piercing cold for like a hybrid griffin set uh, science build. Those two abilities are far and away way better than anything else you can pick up, especially Euphoria, which gives you a gigantic boost of DPS based on your toxicity level to both your physical attacks and your sign damage. So I wish they would have balanced uh, the mutation system a little bit better because it was brought into Blood and Wine to give players more flexibility in the skill system to kind of allow people to role play a little bit better to kind of 
diversify their builds more to have that kind of unique experience doesn't really do that especially for those like myself who play on death march difficulty on new game plus you're gonna want to go with euphoria if you don't want to get slaughtered so uh I, I wish they would have done a little bit more with the sign system to make it more balanced but outside of that and maybe corvo bianco which I know a lot of people like having their own winery, but I didn't spend too much time in it. I didn't feel like there was a lot of stuff going on. There's really not too much I can critique about The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine. It's a fantastic, again, miniature size Witcher experience for an insane value. So if you haven't played Blood and Wine yet, um, I would say go ahead and pick up Hearts of Stone first. That story is phenomenal. Tremendous. Just absolutely fantastic. The characters you meet are wonderful and the story is so laser focused and interesting i would say pick up hearts of stone first then go ahead and pick up blood and wine but i what am i even saying this for probably everyone's already beat these expansions because they're so phenomenal uh, i just wanted to share my love for them in today's video so thanks for watching i really appreciate it i'll see you guys in our next video take care until then see you later